Hello everybody and welcome to another customer success uh, VMware Cloud Team office hours. This is Matt Vandenbeld. Uh, we're we're going to do a, actually going to do a little bit of interesting stuff. So we got a, a new guy on our team who's just joined. He didn't know I was going to throw him under the bus and, and introduce him, uh, but I thought I would. Uh, so as, as part of uh, VMware Cloud and our initiative to, to for the global reach and and we're expanding definitely outside of Americas, which is where uh, most of our team currently is based. Uh, we have the the new guy, uh, Mr. Rick Hoffman. Rick, do you want to say hi? So yeah, hello everyone. This is Rick Hoffman. I just joined the team. So do you want to give uh, give everybody a little bit of a, a blurb about who you are, where you're from, uh, kind of the area you're going to be working in? Uh, just so they can kind of get familiar. Your Twitter handle as well, of course. So yeah, as I said, I'm Rick Hoffman. I'm based out of Germany, Hanover to be precise. I just joined recently to the CSA team. I'm coming from the TAM organization. So I used to be a technical account manager within VMware. I'm already with the company for almost eight years now. Um, so yeah, I probably will support most of the German market or in Europe in general and help out the team. So it's interesting. So that, you know, the, the German market, um, and I guess it's just, again, this is just kind of the office hour, so we're a little flying off the cuff here, but so we do have our data center in Frankfurt and I know that the, the, the German uh, companies and, and, and that the corporate regulations there really do have to ensure that a lot of their, their workloads and data reside within Germany. Is that is that correct? Uh, so basically that is correct. Most of the German customers are very concerned about their data, so they don't want to have it leaving the, com uh, the, the country. And we do have some further regulations, which is not just the GDPR, but um, a few more law laws in general as well. Like when you have any ID data that needs to be um, separately, separately protected, and um, like, you know, driver's license IDs and passport IDs and all that stuff is not allowed to leave the country um, except for when it is needed and um, needed, yeah, needed by, let's say, an airline or something. But outside of that, it, German counts, uh, customers or companies even are not allowed to transfer those data outside of the country um, without the permission of the actual owner of the property or ID. Oh, that's good to that's good to have some clarification around that, and uh, we do have a number of large customers uh, out that part of the world, and uh, and we're going to ex expanding as well uh, tomorrow. So uh, one of the other things I want to cover, and for those that, that look on Twitch, um, the office hours is expanding a little bit. So we have this one will stay. So this is our America's call, even though we have our EMEA brethren on it uh, tomorrow. Uh, will also be an office hours, but they'll be driven by the EMEA folk. And then Thursday will be APJ. So we're we're trying to break it up to be a little bit more uh, time zone friendly in other regions uh, and to give everybody as much of an opportunity to come in and, and ask questions or, or see features or or whatever have you. Um, so we're, we're working really hard to be as available to the customers and uh, if you're internal VMware people or partners or whatever to to be able to consume it. You can see that um, uh, schedule on our event page on Twitch. I will be putting it, uh, fixing the schedule up on my blog on vcloudmat.com. And there is also a Zoom link that's going out with the Zoom link is now a, a reoccurring meeting. So uh, you can just put it into your calendar and come in and, and, and chat with us or ask questions and um, all of those kinds of things to you know, really uh, get the, the most benefit out of things as, as possible. So uh, one of the things that uh, has happened just recently is we have uh, put in our M6 release. So uh, for all of those that don't know, we, we worked, we used to work in milestone releases. And I think I've talked about this before. So there was M1, M2, M3, M4, M5, and now we just hit M6. We're changing that verbiage a little bit to kind of go to uh, a more date centric release so you'll probably hear us you'll probably hear m7 m8 still because those are still in the pipeline but beyond that we're going to be changing the nomenclature a little bit and and uh you know really working on um 
just kind of it's kind of a more of a of an internal uh, facility thing, but you, you'll see this refer to that a little bit differently. Is kind of why I wanted to to highlight that. Um, but we did just hit M6. Um, there's a few uh, relatively major things that that so, and we'll be going over this more uh, in depth next week uh, when I do the more official webinar. But um, a couple of the really big things that that. Uh, seem small but are actually are quite big that I wanted to highlight as part of our M6 release is um, this default logical network change. So this is actually a change that, that our group drove. So when you kicked out at SDDC in VMware Cloud, we used to create this default uh, compute network of 192.168.1.0 slash 24, which obviously bumped into a whole lot of um, on-prem stuff, uh, default ranges, and, and other products. So, and we were actually seeing customers actually using it. So, the, the premise behind this network was you could create an SDDC, you could start a workload today, and there is a network available for you to connect to. So, now this is uh, optional um, when deploying the SDDC um, to, to create that. A, a default, it's not there anymore. And where we were seeing this more is is when we had bigger customers and stuff that were doing direct connect a lot of routing. All of a sudden, they'd see this network pop up um, in their routing tables and had no idea kind of where it was coming from. So we removed that. So and again, it's just kind of to me to highlights the you know this is customer feedback through our customer success team back into engineering and we made the change, right? So this is a very highly fluid, um, very customer responsive offering. Uh, so if you guys have thoughts, comments, opinions, definitely direct them to me. Uh, find find Rick. Uh, Will has jumped into our Zoom chat, but he doesn't have his microphone on, so I can just talk uh, about him and he can't respond, uh, which is great. Find Will Rodbard, and we can get these features put in for you. You know, if we look at it and analyze it and look at, you know, you have a reasonable request, we can absolutely make these kinds of, you know, like I said, seemingly small changes happen, uh, as well as the BGP routes for on-premises networking and, and overall networking topology. So this is all feedback that we had kind of given in uh, to our prospective engineering and be used to that their customers are saying, you know, we need to fix this. Uh, the other big things are, are around uh, databases, which is a custom CPU core count. So this is, you know, for certain unnamed databases that, you know, potentially may not play friendly with their licensing. You can now disable queue core counts. So if you have a big database in terms of stores, so need to scale up the number of hosts to fit the storage, you can actually turn off compute cores so that you don't pay as much for the licenses while still getting kind of the, the service you needed before. And we've added native support for Microsoft SQL Server clustering um, without the need for the ISO setup. So that's, that's pretty good. Uh, a couple of really kind of cool things too, uh, and, and this is kind of funny to me because this is one of the things, and and I know Rick, you're a little bit uh, later to the game, but one of the, the key things that we used to tell people all the time is, you know, be be really really careful naming your SDDC because you can't change us after. And we actually had had customers that had redeployed SDDCs because the name didn't wasn't correct or didn't fit with what they did later on. You know, sometimes maybe they named it like a POC and then it became a not POC or they named it a region and, you know, but then it bumped into another SDC region. Anyway, now you can rename the SDC, which is a big step. So the only thing really that cannot be undone on creating an SDC now is that management cider range that, that you provide. Now, Linking the AWS account, we can do a lot of stuff on the back end. It's not necessarily easy, but can be done. But, you know, now this is, like I said, when you go through, uh, and I guess whether you create a stretch cluster or not. So I guess those are the two things that you really, really, really have to be uh, for sure on when you create the SEC is what your management side range is and whether you're going with a multi-AZ cluster or not. Those are the only two things now that, that really can't be changed after the fact that would require a new deploy of an SDDC. So, uh, and maybe someday we'll fix that. I doubt we'll be able to fix the management side range um, just because we're, I'm sure everybody out there that's 
been a vSphere administrator knows how much fun it would be to re-IP every single host and vCenter and NSX and all of these um, these other things. Um, so uh, definitely something uh, that, that that'll probably stay uh, and probably the AZ cluster stuff as well. But we're you know we're continuing to make things better. Uh, we also have a new role called the Delete Restricted role. Um, this again was another one of those customer asks that came in and said, "Hey, we we really need this feature. Like we need to have." You know, somebody that, that is an administrator in terms of being able to add capacity and, and administer the environment, but we don't want them able to delete everything, you know, which, you know, they kind of sat back and thought about it and went, you know, well, that's, actually a, that's actually a really good idea. Um, so we put it in. So now when you actually go into the um, uh, identity and, and users page, I think I have actually open here. Uh, you can actually see that there is a delete. Actually, I don't want to open the whole list of permissions and stuff we have there, but um, you can actually see that there's a delete restricted role in there. Now, a note to the wise, and it's actually in here, is, is if you give somebody both the admi administrator and the administrator delete restricted, they'll have the most per permissive rights, so they'll be able to do everything. So if you are a current customer um, and you go in and you wanted to, to modify some permissions, perhaps with some of your administrators, make sure you uncheck the administrator and add the administrator delete restricted don't um, don't have both or you're going to end up with you know the same results as you had uh, before uh, and look at that uh, Rick we have uh, language and regional format support for German have you tried this out yet or no uh, I haven't but I've seen that for example in the H5 client we have German language support as well now uh, like in VSV on-prem, but um, from what I've seen for the on-prem version, sometimes there's some glitches in the actual translation. Uh, so I prefer going with the English one anyway. So in case you have to open NSR or even get in touch with us using the chat, it is way easier to just have it in English. Yeah, I hear that a lot, um, you know, from, from our European counterparts is they just do everything in English. Um, which means, I guess the English have taken over the world. Uh, I see that Will's got his microphone on now, and I suppose he might want to comment on that, but maybe not. Um, so, yeah, I mean, English has obviously been the default language of all um, VMware product sets for a while, but there's been a, a considerable effort over the last couple of years to regionalize all product sets. Um, and I believe the cloud service portal, so all products available via the cloud service portal will follow um follow suit with what we support on the on-prem products yeah just looking that uh looks like we've also added regional form of support for french spanish korean simplified chinese and traditional chinese so um uh, and uh will and i are, are lucky enough to be members of um uh what we call the ctoa uh at, at vm we're in it's basically an ambassador of the the office of the cto uh we just had our our conference here a couple weeks ago and uh really fun filled week uh drink from the fire hose kind of week uh, also why we didn't stream that week um and we met with the uh ux ui design team there and it was actually extremely enlightening uh how how seriously vmware is taking the UI uh, and regionalization and, and all those kinds of things now to, to make this as, as easy to use. Um, any thoughts on that one, Will? Were you in that session or did you, did you miss it? Yeah, the, yeah. I, I was yeah. just going to say I agree. Um, it, it's, um, I believe every, every business unit within VMware now has to have a member of the design team as part of a product uh, design and product release team so that uh, UI and UX are kind of first world citizens in the product development, e including down to um, API development. So how, um, for example, the cloud client used to work, that was completely redesigned um, from a usability perspective. So yeah, it's, it's really interesting that um, it's been seen as that important, the, the UX that, that they sit on every single development team. Yeah, and, and um, when they kind of showed their workflows and, and for how they kind of approach uh, design, um, I mean, it's, it's somewhat IT-related, but really more, it's more human 
related, I guess I would call it, uh, as opposed to um, technology related. I know there's a blend of the two, but uh, there's a lot of work that goes into this, and it's really kind of cool. And I think, and, and I and I personally say we we were really seeing it in the VMware cloud interface. I mean, uh, you kind of tradition that you know compare this to some of our our products of of old, and to me this is a million times better. Um, the other thing that that's coming up and is starting to kick up. Uh, very, very, very soon here is our NSX V to T migrations. I know uh, this is going to be a good portion of what our, our, our team is going to be working on here. Uh, probably for the next little while is moving our customers that were, were on V uh, into T. Uh, I think probably we should probably do a session just dedicated to that. Uh, probably a little bit closer to when we actually start implementing uh, those changes. So we're going to go through kind of a... Uh, early access testing group first and then kind of roll it through uh, the rest of our customers. And it is uh, an in-place uh, upgrade, so it's not, it's not you know, we created a completely new SDC and people have to migrate stuff and worry about layer two spans and all those kinds of things. It it will be a, a move from the VSDDC to the TSDDC. Uh, and, and depending on the size of your SDDC, obviously it'll take longer for some than others. But NSXT is definitely our way moving forward. Um, I, I think it brings a lot of advantages to the table, and it'll be good to kind of get everybody up to that that level set uh, of being on the same networking staff. Because I know uh, for us it's a little bit complex because it's some, sometimes some customers will start asking me some questions about, you know, how do I do this on the VPN, or how do I do that, and or what about this on the direct connect, and I'll start talking, you know, the T, and they'll be like, well, I don't see that option. And you're like, oh, oh, sorry, you're still on, you're on the V side. Uh, this is how you do it. Not, not that there's too much functionality. There's, there is a degree of functionality difference and a lot of advantages to going to T, but um, some of the V customers definitely, uh, you know, there's just different ways of looking at it. It also is going to help us immensely in our documentation. Uh, I, I know we hear you out there that sometimes our documentation needs to be a little bit improved. Uh, that's something our group is, is actively taking on as well. That's also why we do the office hours like we do uh, to answer these kind of questions and, and gaps because this is such a quick moving product that, you know, we have some documentation. I think most of it refers to T now. Uh, but there's probably still some holdovers that uh, or maybe some of the products around it that still reference some of the V constructs. So, again, we're catching up to the fast moving business. We're delivering features and, you know, and... We do have documentation for it. It's just sometimes I think we can improve on it. What do you think about that, Will or Rick? Um, well, I was actually just going to say um, with regards to the upgrades, it's, it'd be worth noting that um, we're not going to literally just throw you a how-to guide over the fence and let you get on with it. This is a very prescribed process that we'll work with you on. Um, and the reality is there aren't uh it's not like every single customer's on nsxv currently and needs to migrate uh it's only the i guess the uh, majorly the early adopters that are still running on v right yeah uh so we switched over to nsxt being the default sddc i want to say sometime in december i think it was around that time frame uh january for sure um if not december and we had nsxt SDDC is available from October, so um, you're right. There, there is there is a few customers on V, but predominantly everybody is already on to T. And and and, and thank you for highlighting that, Will. Yes, the you know the customer success team is going to end up working with a lot of customers, and and not just our team, but other teams as well to you know really do an analysis of your environment, um, work through the upgrade with you, and then troubleshoot any of the potential issues with you. We're not just going to like Will said, click this button and, you know, wish you luck. <laughs> um, so, uh, and and there's always that, that good old chat support feature, uh, which I, I had the opportunity to spend some time with some of our support team last week. Uh, so we're, uh, the reason we didn't stream last week uh, is all of us, uh, Will, Rick, and I got to meet Rick for the first time. And Will, actually, Will, he wasn't there. Um but at, at Tech Summit last week, which is one of our internal conferences for uh, a big enablement. And definitely from, from this, and, and I'd like to get Rick's perspective as, from coming in as a, 
as a new guy as well, but it, it definitely showed me this week, or sorry, last week, that VMware is extremely serious about this VMware cloud thing. I mean, this was paramount in a lot of the sessions, uh, the keynotes, all those kinds of things about how much we're driving this product and really, it really is a major focus on making this succeed and making this the best offering for, I guess what we're calling the hybrid cloud. Um, so, yeah, Rick, do you want to give me kind of your impression as kind of a, a newcomer into the space and maybe a little bit of an outsider to a degree as well? <laughs> so, yeah, I fully agree on what you just said. And um, I mean, you can even see that we are growing the team like myself, just joining for Europe and especially for the German market. So, yes, VMware is making a huge step and putting in a lot of effort to enable pretty much everyone that this is... Um, going to be successful that we can help you and uh, our customers to yeah onboard as successful as even possible and um, to see how how easy it can be to utilize this uh, solution uh, for you for different um, scenarios like disaster recovery and stuff like that so yes there have been a lot of um, a lot of trainings and enablements uh, during that week and yeah I'm really looking forward to to see it grow. Yeah, that's uh, that's good. Uh, that's good perspective. And like I said, it's what um, it w- I would I would actually like to for anybody kind of watching or you know in chat and and or watch this on YouTube and um, for as a know, we have that cloud CS at VMware dot com that we'll get to our our group with comments and stuff. Is I think VMware Cloud to me has highlighted again the very diverse nature uh, and skill sets of a lot of the customers that we work with. So there's there's some that are in, incredibly smart, incredibly in tune with all the features of vSphere and NSX and vSAN, and they could jump in here and start, you know, getting everything up and running, just bam. Where, you know, we still have a a lot of customers that that have very, you know, traditional basic setups that just kind of want to get out of managing themselves and move into the cloud and uh, need a little bit more assistance. And and so I'm kind of curious because we we do have, uh, you know, some customers that, wholly on board themselves, wholly get everything up and running themselves and do it. Um, but then we have the also customers that, you know, I, I got feedback um, just yesterday about, you know, is there kind of a, you know, a, a, a VMC for for idiots, uh, um, you know, kind of document. Uh, and I hesitate to call Dustin's guide a VMC for idiots, and hopefully he's not watching. But um, it, it's not... So I think to a degree, there's a lot of customers that are very interested in this, that they're really kind of struggling to just get going. Uh, and we have a lot of pretty good technical guidance, but perhaps, and this is where I really want the feedback, is is there more of a need or more of a want and, and for kind of more basic, you know, this is this is the offering, not kind of marketing or architecture or any of those kinds of things, but, you know, this is the offering, this is how it works. This is kind of what this feature does. This is kind of what that feature does. This is how you access it. And I know we do this a lot in our YouTube videos and uh, in office hours, you could definitely come and ask us. But is you know, are, do you guys feel that maybe we're we're lacking a little bit, maybe in some of that kind of basic how-to documentation? You know, kind of a more prescriptive walking through the setup kind of stuff. And Rick, maybe you're good to answer this because again, you're you're pretty new to the team and uh, haven't had as much exposure to a lot of these features. So I, I'm just kind of curious as to your opinion and, and to the opinions of everybody else out there. Um, yeah, so maybe so there's a lot of documentation, a lot of videos out there. But as you was just, as you were just saying, to have sort of a run book to see, hey, what does this feature do, or, or what does that feature do? So that maybe that is actually a good point to. Uh, work on and to to provide to, to everyone out there so that you know okay if i click here or there like an explanation sort of page like what you know you have the sdc op or the, the cloud console open there um so that you sort of have like a walkthrough available to customers so that when they click on the summary they know okay there's a highlight what does this do what does that do um maybe that's a good starting point but um Sometimes I see that customers are struggling even with the basics like what do you need an AWS account for? 
we do have that in um, in our documentation. I believe it's in Dustin's uh, handbook or, or VMC book as well. But some people, you know, are looking in different places. So that I reckon that we could come up with um, a more central location for having a starting point so that customers can just, you know, um, yeah, walk through themselves at their own pace and see what they need and um, what, you know, the actual options are. Yeah, no, I, that's good feedback, Rick. And I obviously kind of agree. And, and one of the things that um, is on my list of things to do, and I, and I apologize, this is taking, there's a lot of things on my list of things to do, uh, is on our YouTube page, I really wanted to put, create, and I'm, and I'm going to throw Will and, and, and Rick under the bus here as well as the rest of my teams, I wanted to create shorter videos. So if you go to our YouTube channel now, there is actually a, a short video that I believe is, is Mo hit uh, from our, our CSE partner team. They put together a little short video. I think it's like three, four minutes on, here's how you create an SCDC. Uh, and I really kind of want to do that for a lot more features of, you know, here's how uh, you create uh, a network segment. And actually, that you know, network segment is kind of a funny one as well because I've actually had conversations with customers that aren't familiar with NSX in any way, shape, or form. They're like, well, how do I how do I create a port group? How do I create a network? All right. So, I, I think there's just some of these things that that we just take for granted uh, in our roles, being very active and, and up to date with all of the new technologies we're adding. That you know, there's a lot of customers that just are using the old traditional, you know, distributed switch, or in some cases, a standard switch. That when they go to create a network, um, it's not anywhere within the vCenter interface. It's it's here, and I know it's covered in some of our guides, but it's if you don't know what to look for, it's tough to find it. So I'd like to put kind of, you know, little two, three minutes videos together and, and put it up on our YouTube page and, and preferably put it in kind of a playlist of, you know, starting off with Paige has a great video on, you know, here's kind of the prerequisites, which we may need to update to a degree because some of the stuff may have changed. Um, you know, but here's that, you know, the here's how you create an org. Here's how you, uh, another big one is here's how you assign a fund. Um which is kind of uh, a thing that some of our, our customers are missing, that, that even when you buy a subscription, you kind of have to activate it. So I think there's a lot of little gaps there that that I'd like to answer, at least put onto our, our YouTube page. And, and then, yeah, have you know, maybe just a short doc or something that goes along with it as well to to really help customers kind of, kind of walk through it. Because, uh, and, and, and again, I would really love that feedback from everybody out there. Uh, anybody out there that uh, around you know some of the the problems they've hit or some of the common stuff because you know guys like me I've, I've worked at this product since you know its inception so there's a lot of stuff that I would probably miss uh, just because I know where everything is that that could be something that you know is, is stumbling some people now one of the the key features that that uh, I'm actually working on right now as well is uh, you know, I'm going to ask this question to Rick and Will and and we'll see what they're their comment is, is but but how many people actually read release notes? Do you think? <laughs> I can only speak for myself or my uh, former VMware customers or TAM customers in particular. So myself, I do read them to a certain extent. Not every release note, but in regards to NSX or uh, in this case VMC, I do read them. But I know customers who are just you know reading the highlights basically and then not going into any deep further details uh, so that they skim through it basically. Um, so yeah, I'd say that not all of our customers are actually reading them because it's, sometimes it's just too much. And as you just pointed out earlier in the beginning of this, um, this uh, webinar, that sometimes when somebody is showing you, hey, look, this feature is now available, um, that they digest it way better that way than just, you know, here, just, here is the customer, there's a link to the release notes, have fun. That's my impression anyway. Yeah, I'd, I'd say more people uh, read release notes than read a EULA. But, um, um, <laughs> so so that's them. greater than zero is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe <laughs> one. I, often, I read them for a laugh and I can't sleep. No, I, I would say that uh, a lot of people jump to the um, known issues lists primarily. Um, yeah, pretty much. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, so, so one of the things that I'm actually working with um, – some of our teams on some of the engineering is i'd like you guys's impression on this as well so what i really wanted to do uh, if you guys look at the screen is uh, we do have a little notification bell at the top there um 
I want to get like like most other websites and stuff when they release new features. There's kind of like a little alert at the top that says, "Hey, by the way, Mr. Customer, you're logging in here. Here's some new stuff we've added. Click on the link to go to the release notes if you want more data." Do you, do you think that that would be of value? Yeah, absolutely. I don't know why it wouldn't be there. I mean, it's an easy thing to do, right? Yeah, and we're exactly. working on it. Uh, especially, you know, when you know there's a new release coming up that, you know, when you're already signed up to the service, then why not have it in there like sort of like a pre-release note uh, so that the customer may know, hey, listen, this and that is coming. So that would make perfect sense to me. So we, we already do um, things like that for the on-prem software anyway. So um, we do things like the support advisor, which is a, a mail alert that comes out every week with the top 10 most viewed KB articles, for example. So something similar might also be useful. Well, but how do you, how many people do you think actually read that though? Just, <laughs> just uh, I mean, there, I know that there's a few uh, and I'm not discounting your point, um, but I know that I'm on a lot of email lists for stuff and it just kind of gets into the inbox and you're like, yeah, uh, I'll get around to that and read that. And so then... in regards to the uh, support advisor, which um, Will just mentioned, I believe quite a few people are actually reading it because when they're running their on-prem environment and they're on a certain version, they want to know, hey, is there anything I have to look for? Or is there anything in particular which may affect my on-prem infrastructure? So I'd say, yeah, the support advisory um, that, that's probably being read at least for the headlines. Like, okay, what is this KB about? Like, um, oh yeah, we have an issue with this and that. Um, let's say just, you know, what comes to mind, um, the motion to a certain, um, version or something that there's a KB for that. So that yeah. definitely makes sense and is definitely read by customers. And, and maybe this is something that we can, uh, also leverage, uh, your, your old community, uh, Rick, the TAM. Uh, community to also distribute some information, but um, I personally, I, I think we could do this twofold. I think we could do well, actually multiple fold. We could have that email. Like I said, I would love to see just a little, a little widget, uh, or even just using the current notifications tab there to just be kind of like, hey, by the way, you now have vSAN encryption, or hey, by the way, you're now on NSXT, or hey, you know, just little things like that to make it a little bit. Uh, so that easier to consume. And like I said, that's something that's being uh, actively uh, worked on. And, you know, in a perfect world, it'd be kind of nice to that then we would actually have that document with the what's new and then perhaps uh, a video or something along it that shows, you know, this is also what that, that feature does as well. Um, because I know even even I, um, and, and I think Will could, and, and, and Rick, you're a little bit new, so you, you haven't had the opportunity to do this, but... Um, I even get surprised by some of the features that get put in and I'm on the list of approvers for them and know all the roadmaps and occasionally I even I'll come in here and go, Oh, Hey, that's new. Um, so I, I think that's, it's, that's the fun part of it, right? <laughs> well, no, and, and, and again, and I think that, that, you know, uh, some of why I would like to put this in the portal and perhaps for an email is because, I don't want to spam people either because we do put a lot of new features in on a fairly regular basis. Um, and one of the things we're also working in, um, just for all the customers watching as well, um, and I, I'm sorry, I blocked the YouTube link there. Uh, well, I'll put it in, in into Twitch chat here in a second. But sure. um, no, I lost my train of thought. Thanks a lot, Will. <laughs> <laughs> he did oh. that on purpose. <laughs> yeah, it was around the, the speed and stuff of, of, of the features that we're putting in. And, you know, like this thing changes extremely more rapidly than our on-prem stuff does. Um, and I don't I don't want it just to kind of become noise, I guess, for customers. I would like to to really more, you know, just highlight all the Yeah, cool I think if that, and... if that bell sort of had a number against it, you know, with the number of new alerts, you know, it's totally in... Not not invasive. You can click on it if you want to, and every time it's you know a new feature is released, uh, the bell is highlighted or something just to show that there is new stuff available. You don't. It's not like you have to uh, acknowledge and click through or anything. It's just there for your information. I think that would be really useful. Oh, now I remember where I was going. Uh, thank you for that, Will. Uh, I thought I had set up this command in Twitch. I apologize. I'll put it in there. Uh, if people could just put uh, 
that's so that uh, a link it to uh, in, tw- in Twitch is to our customer success pages where uh, I'm intending to put a lot of this information. But uh, the point I want to touch upon is something we're really working hard on is is the notification email system uh, for this platform because a lot of the people that are going to be affected by a lot of the changes aren't necessarily the at the level in the organization that's going to be the ones that get the emails uh, like fund owners are usually not IT people. Um, so we're, we're working on a better way of, of communicating that. But to me, one of the easiest shortcuts is just to pop it in the portal so that when people are in there, they're like, Hey, cool. Or there's a maintenance coming up or um, those kinds of things. Um, but yeah, we are, we are definitely focusing on, um, on adding more and more and more content to our, to our YouTube channel. And, and again, hopefully in a, you know, more consumable bits. So you kind of don't have to watch the, the hour long video on, on HCX, um, to kind of get that little piece out that you need to know about, well, how do I, how do I create the, the layer two span or how do I do the bolt migration? We want to kind of really break those into very consumable bits. And, uh, and again, if anybody out there has any, you know, uh, recommendations or, or comments or what they'd like to see in kind of first that could help us, you know, direct what content we work on uh, first. Uh, now that I mentioned HCX, I also wanted to uh, to, to say that uh, we are going to be doing an HCX update here in, I think it's going to be about three weeks now. Um, we're going to be doing a more formal webinar. I'm going to be trying to, to grab some of the guys from our team and pair with some of the people from the, the business unit um, to go through because the, the product itself has changed significantly and it's actually our number one watch video on YouTube is, is around HCX. So we want to make sure that we're uh, putting up the, the most uh, up-to-date current content because there are uh, a couple of new features that have coming in that are really big. Uh, cloud to cloud's coming in, uh, the mesh is coming in. Um, so we really want to make sure that we, we get on, on to that. So I've been talking for a while. Uh, Will, do you got any uh, any cool things happening this week? Oh, on the spot. Um, I, I don't at the moment, actually. Um, I'm just going through um, the enablement stuff for NSXT migration that we uh, was announced yesterday. So I was just going over that myself. So I'm, I'm, I can uh, have that better in mind for when I'm, talk to, uh, when I'm talking to customers about it. But yeah, nothing else on, on the go. Yeah, and, and we talk about that more now, but I'm, <clears throat> I'm not. I'm honestly actually not sure how much of that is, quote unquote, public information right now about the exact procedures and, and timelines and stuff. So that's kind of where I'm being a little yeah, it's, <clears throat> I think flippant it's on it. Come out in the next week or so, isn't it? So it's um, you can't really go into too much detail about it right now, other than the fact that there is a plan. It is being um, it's been tested and run through so that we know when we start doing these for customers that it it will definitely work. Yeah, and uh, and we're going to be definitely working hand in hand for at least the first few for sure uh, to ensure the success of this. And um, our team has been quite drivers behind uh, ensuring that this is delivered in a way that makes it as easy for customers to consume. Um, there were some talks of some other approaches early on that uh, I know I've kind of put my foot down and said, no, we're not going to do it that way. Um, we're not going to make a customer create a whole new SDC and migrate everything on their own. That's just not an option. Um, go back to the drawing board. Uh, so that's to a degree why it's taken a little bit more time, uh, as well <clears throat> is because we want to make sure that this is hopefully as seamless as possible to, to move from one to the other. And then once we're onto this platform, um, I know that, that uh, again, I'm on a list of approvers, and part of my definition of done is, is that no feature will require a redeploy on SDC. So we are really, really going to have that mindset going forward that um, this is kind of the last major change that's going to be required, kind of, it's not really a new SDC, but the level of work that this requires um, to get to the new feature set. So we're really that's top of mind in all of our engineering teams. So this should be the kind of the last painful one. And I know famous last words, knock on wood, um, those kinds of things. But again, I work with the engineering teams and they are completely wholly committed to not having this kind of impact again uh, with our customers. Now, 
Uh, that being said, most of my customers are actually willing to take on a little bit of the pain uh, to get to the V to the T. Is, is that kind of your guys' experience as well? And again, I know Rick, you're a little bit new, but uh, maybe Will can, can answer that for some of his customers. Yeah, so um, I, I guess um, for new deploys now, obviously, it's worth noting that they'll all get T anyway. So it, like I said earlier, it is for customers that have been on the platform for a while. Um, what I, I was talking to a customer the other day and they, they definitely want to get onto T to get the new feature set. Um, so they're, they're really looking forward to the, uh, the rollout. So now I'm going to put, uh, could put Rick back on the spot again as being the new guy. We always pick on the new guy, Yay. you know, <laughs> uh, we did go to a hockey game together in, uh, in, in Vegas, which was fantastic. By the way, I wanted to bring up that the flames did beat Vegas, uh, on the weekend. On Sunday, mm. uh, we beat them six three, so we we got our revenge. So the back to back game won, yeah, fair yeah. enough. <laughs> yeah, so uh, the Flames are hopefully picking up a little bit more here again. I won't talk too much about hockey; it's the Canadian enemy coming out. Um, <laughs> now, how much exposure kind of did you have to the VMC before before you came on? Is you know you kind of had played around with it, or, or are you kind of looking at this from a completely new lens, a new perspective? No, actually, I did have some experience with it. So um, one of my TAM customers was uh, doing a POC uh, about a year back now. And back then, we had nothing here in Frankfurt, like in Germany or in Europe in general. So we, they were deploying in uh, North Virginia. And we were testing it successfully, even with adding extra hosts and doing a layer 2 VPN stretch and all that stuff. We even... Uh, put like a Citrix solution on top of it. Back then, that wasn't supported at all. We know it is today, but we were able to do that and test drive it. And so, yeah, um, so I've been working with them since then. And uh, that was pretty much my exposure all of the time to, uh, yeah, get access to the VMC console. And also internally, we do have a subject meta expert group. And I've been part of that one for about a year now as well. Um, and yeah, had the the honor to work with quite a few of the um, Americas team on that and got early access to some information and detail, which helped a lot. And so, yeah, I'm not new to the stuff. I know most of the, con uh, the, the concepts behind it. Do know some hands-on, and I'm looking forward to get uh, or dig even deeper. Uh, that's good. Uh, I mean, it doesn't quite make my point for me, but thanks. Um, it's kind of looking for a fresh perspective kind of from... The for the product, but it's actually good that to highlight, um, and, and I thank you for that, is, is that we do have pretty major initiatives internally to enable our field, uh, our TAM resources, our SEs, um, to be able to be familiar with the product, be able to articulate it. So if you have questions, you don't necessarily need to come to us. We're way more than, you know, welcome to come to us, absolutely. But, you know, your local, your local teams should be enabled on this now uh, as well, especially after this last week at Tech Summit, where I think you'd have to try to avoid a, a VMware Absolutely. cloud session. Um, and there are a lot of great content uh, there as well. And we're pushing even more initiatives forward uh, to work with some of our delivery teams as well. Um, so uh, one of the things I'd like to mention as well is, is that, you know, if, if for whatever reason you kind of come into, to, you know, the, the VMware cloud and say, hey, I don't know anything about this or I don't want to have anything to do with this. I want to make this someone else's problem. We do have a very large partner community and, and our professional services organization as well can help you out with all of this stuff. Um, so we intended to make it as easy to consume as possible, but if you just need a little help, it's also uh, available out there uh, as well, uh, particularly around migrations. I think that that is something that most customers could definitely use a little bit of insight onto we can give you the technology but i can't break down you know how your app migration should go which app should go first which app should go last which one should go together mm -hmm. and and i know that we have partners and, and our pso is definitely uh, a lot of experience in that realm um of you know data center to data center moves and those kinds of things and essentially in, in my mind this is it's actually not that much different than a data center to a data center move what did you think about that will is it is, you think it's basically the same to the degree, uh, I mean, I know there's other little caveats around it about some of the manageability, but to some degree, it's essentially a data center to just a data center move. 
yeah i mean whenever you're moving one object to an, one object from a location to a location things are going to change you need to make sure your planning's set but yeah it is just a straight move right which i think is one of the the biggest things is you know we hide we talk about this a lot and I'm, uh, sorry to beat the the dead horse perhaps but you know, this is just a VMware virtual machine now running on AWS's infrastructure. It's it's not on top of vSphere. It's, you know, there's no refactoring. There's no redoing the VM or worrying about whether that application is going to run in this new kind of instance type. It's Well, that's the whole benefit, right? It, it's a known it's a known entity. You, you know what a virtual machine is. You know how to manage a virtual machine in vSphere. You're doing it on premises already. Um, by picking it up and moving it into the cloud, but sitting it on the same kind of software, the same kind of um, environment and uh, workload encapsulation that a v VM is, the the learning curve is is almost non-existent. Um, obviously, there are some some differences in the fact that VMware Cloud on AWS is is managed for you from the the host layer, but apart from that, it is the same thing. Yeah, and 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 another thing that we're working very hard on now that is starting to go to early access now is um an enhanced i think we're calling it flexible is the the term but a flexible permissions model so uh one of the major feedbacks that, that we have gotten from the customers and i'm sure that you guys have heard this as well is you know we can't you know, we can't create roles. We have to kind of use the built-in roles that doesn't necessarily work exactly for what we're doing. So we're now going to be opening up that functionality to be able to create uh, different roles. Now, again, you won't be able to create vCenter administrator, uh, but you'll be able to create, you know, other roles with more specific permissions for perhaps some of your administration groups or the, the backup team or auditors or, or whatever have you. So again, uh, we are listening and we are putting these 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 features uh, in as quickly as we can. But again, whenever we put these features in, uh, as I highlighted earlier, we have to ensure that they work for everybody and they don't break anything. Um, and, and you know, it, that, that's a very major focus of ours. And I think that's going to help a lot of customers because uh, I think some of that is, um, to a degree, uh making people feel better i don't know if that's a way of articulating it correctly but i know sometimes the custom role you know the pre-built roles work but somebody's used to having this you know vm and where administrators role as opposed to power users i guess the um the way of looking at it is we we design our products um to cover the widest range of use cases, I guess. And, but we, we never, we can't anticipate every corner case. And there was always gonna be a customer that wants a very specific role to do a very specific task or, you know, stop a very specific task from being able to be performed. Um, and, and we can only continue to improve the product for every user if we, if we capture that feedback and, and bring it back. And I guess the advantage with something like VMware Cloud on AWS over on-premises vCenter and vSphere is that um, if there's a lot of shouting, a lot of noise for a specific role or, or use case, you, you have a lot better chance of getting it into the product earlier because it's a cloud managed service than you would otherwise. And as we've seen with a number of features that have been customer driven already. So, um, so yeah, we, we're never going to be able to predict the kind of roles you, you might necessarily want to use, but it doesn't mean to say that those roles can't be created down the line. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and the more you work with us, uh, the more you give us that feedback, the more we can uh, can help you. And actually, this just so everybody's watching the stream, this isn't actually the VMware Cloud that's having some issues. It's the, the stream having some fun with my network connection. Um, I was just going to show that the, one of the one of the new things that we've added uh, in M6 as well is the um, uh, Elastic DRS, uh, which is something where you can kind of configure the parameters on which your SDDC will scale up and then scale back down as well. So again, really trying to get that elasticity uh, into the environment so that, that you, you never run out of resources. Um, and, and one of the bigger use cases, I think, for that is something that, that Rick touched upon a little bit as well is, is the desktop type environments. So we're getting a lot of customers coming in right now 
uh, that want to run their virtual desktop infrastructure on top. So Horizon, uh, I think it's 7, the latest version is supported on on on-prem and uh, that's the one VCDX I don't have is, is, is EUC. So, so forgive me for not knowing everything about <laughs> that kind of space. Um, but that's one of those spaces where, you know, I can really see a cool use case, especially kind of some, maybe some DR use cases as well, or just getting desktops closer to your users is that, you know, the environment can scale down, you know, during the night when nobody's on and then everybody starts logging in, in the morning, the environment will scale up uh, to house all the desktops you need. And then, uh, again, scale down so that you don't have to buy all of the infrastructure for kind of that that peak usage and then have it sitting at idle 60, 70% of the time. So anything like a disaster emergency uh, service or um, anything where you have a sudden a sudden need to scale out the number of people logging in is just a perfect fit, right? Um, it, it's worth noting that as it's a managed service as well, that there are certain service level agreements that we we commit to. And one of those would mean that we would actually auto scale your environment as soon as you hit certain capacity markers anyway. That's right, isn't it, Mark? Yeah, so you're correct. So the, the primary one is storage. So we will always, 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 regardless of what you set up for um, your, your uh, EDRS settings, if you hit a certain storage threshold, we're always going to scale up. And that's just a stability thing. You know, I think I think all of us who have been around for a while have filled up a data store at some point, And it's not a lot of fun. <laughs> so uh, we definitely want to prevent that from happening for customers. So that's always something there. Uh, and also, yes, we have internal alerting, as, as Will alluded to, that if you're running really hot on CPU or running really hot on, on memory, uh, our support team will actually... Uh, initiate kind of a conversation back to you and say, hey, uh, did you want to scale this up? Or or if it gets to a really critical point of, say, it's running at 99%, we will scale it up. Again, just to maintain that stability for you and then work with you uh, either if you have some kind of VM that's just kind of going out of control or something and, and causing it. But our, our primary focus is, is to ensure the stability of the platform and to deliver um, our SLA uh, to you. So I think that that's a very good point, and thank you for for highlighting that. Will that's something that we will continue to to always always uh, do, regardless of what your EDRS settings are. So, uh, like I said, I've I've talked a lot. Uh, I don't see any questions coming in the chat. If anybody has any questions in the chat, uh, by all means, go ahead and ask them. Um, we're you know, we're running really full out now we have quite a lot of customers coming on uh quite a lot of big customers coming on um are, are you guys seeing the growth out there in, a, in a me as well I, I know i see a lot of those and i'm really glad we hired you guys because um six o'clock in the morning meetings are bad enough for me let alone <laughs> three o'clock in the morning meetings um so um are, are you guys seeing that 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 growth over that way as well yeah, definitely. I think that um, as as word gets out, shall we say, more and more people are looking at it. Um, similar in a similar vein to um, how cloud was first experimented with, you know, dipping your toe in the water, having a bit of a development um, development play sandbox area. But the reality is, very rapidly and quite early on in the sales cycle, I think the the message that this is effectively just vSphere on Amazon's hardware is getting out there and then people realize actually well i'm already running in aws for things natively and i'm already running vSphere on premises why why don't i combine the two so the the uh the realization of uh, value is is happening really early on so i i think it, the the growth is just going to be exponential absolutely i can absolutely second that the same is uh happening in germany um, in the beginning, so many German customers were going like, oh, it's a cloud system, but hey, we're utilizing AWS anyway. And I saw that during the AWS summit in Berlin last year, I've heard about stuff um, uh, from, from this year's AWS summit. I've heard that on reInvent last year in November, where I was lucky enough to, to attend. And uh, yeah, it is really picking up and there's so many so many questions around it, like uh, on, on Twitter, there's questions. 
Um, I've attended VMUGs where where so many people were uh, people were actually asking about the solution, the service, um, and uh, when we showcased it, uh, they weren't believing in the first place that we're actually showing something live, and that it's not just a recorded demo, and that it's easy, very easy for them to onboard. And uh, the more people actually realize that. I reckon that the more people will actually see um, value in it and then um, to rethink their maybe DR strategies and to extend even further. Yeah, that's an interesting point that, that both you guys just brought up. And, and, and I know uh, Will's been in the, the customer success team with, with me for a while. Um, that we always seem to be the kind of the great bringer together of internal organizations. And we're really seeing that with, with this product in AWS. Like the number of customers that I... I talked to that were like, you know what? I actually really didn't know that we had a bunch of stuff in, in AWS and a whole team working on that until I kind of, uh, and I think uh, you talked about it earlier as well about, you know, I needed this AWS account. So I started kind of talking about it and somebody said, oh yeah, we got a team that does that. Um, and, and now they're actually working together and going, hey, how, how can I get my services to talk to your services better? And, and how can we kind of get this stuff to work together? Whereas before they're working in, absolute isolation that, that's absolutely true again yeah I, I saw the same with one of my customers so right now um it's not just you know the vSphere team and the storage and the network team now they're uh, a cloud team basically where everyone talks to everyone and this really makes sense and it helps open doors definitely All right. Well, I think uh, I think we're coming up at the top of the hour here. Uh, not not a lot of questions in. And again, uh, for anybody watching this uh, later on on YouTube or even watching live now that has questions or or uh, suggestions for either features or future office hours or future webinars, absolutely send it our way. Uh, do check out the YouTube channel. the 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 link is in chat. It's also at the bottom of the dashboard. It's basically via uh, YouTube dot com slash uh, it's like slash c slash uh, vmware cloud customer success uh, all one word a lot of content up there that hopefully help it and we're going to really be trying to expand that going forward uh, i'd like to really thank uh, will and rick our european counterparts that are hopefully taking on the european stream uh, in the near future uh, just throwing them under the bus as they're they're here <laughs> no, i appreciate it um, uh, absolutely i think that again we really want to make this kind of uh, 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 as accessible as possible and, and particular to the regions of which people have questions. So like, like I said earlier in, in the, um, the session that we're going to be having a, this is the Americas one, we're going to have an EMEA one and we're going to have an APJ one. Um, and, uh, and I'll get these guys to lead that at some point. But again, I do really appreciate you guys coming in and, and, and offering your insights. And, and so it's not just me uh, talking to myself for an hour, although you guys know me, I could do that as well quite easily. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I know a lot of that is just, you know, it's such a cool product and stuff that I, there's a million different things we could talk about on any given day. Um, but I would like to thank everybody for their time, for coming out, uh, watching this or watching it on, on YouTube afterwards. Uh, again, we'll have uh, a Mia stream. Uh, I don't know if that's going to be happening tonight because it's actually three o'clock my time. And I don't know if we can wrap these guys up quite on, on time to do that, but we'll definitely be doing that next week. Uh, the APJ one we'll be doing on Thursday because that's, I think, at 4 o'clock uh, in the afternoon my time, so I'll be able to do that, and hopefully I can drag in one of our other new guys, Clement. Uh, and then next week we're also going to be doing a webinar where we're going to be diving in more into the new features in M6 uh, and how they all function, uh, and maybe a little bit more of the further roadmap talk, and then uh, HCX coming uh, after that. And again, any suggestions for content or questions, uh, cloudcs at vmware.com. And again, thank you very much, everybody, and I will see you next week. Thanks, Matt. Cheers. <laughs>